Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Robert Cummings, and I will be the moderator for this exciting student panel uh, with our student guests here. Um, and I'm happy to kick us off. Um, to start, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature in the webinar. And we will start with just a brief introduction to the programs uh, that we offer and then dive right into our student panel discussion. And I'll, I'll have our student panelists introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, so to start off, uh, the MIT SCM program offers two programs, um, two programs of uh, study. One is the SCM residential program and the other is the uh, blended student program. Uh, we have students from both uh, joining us today so they can provide their insights uh, uh, into, into both tracks. Um, first, the residential program offers a 10 month on-campus experience. Um, it is designated for um, early career professionals. Um, so those who have uh, two to five years of work experience and are looking to uh, get a more specialized training in supply chain management uh, and then return to, to the workforce with that new information that you've learned. Um, and with that in mind, we offer um, custom career development and dedicated recruiting opportunities uh, in the fall and the spring as well. Uh, and for international students, um, this opportunity also comes with OPT and STEM extension work authorization. Um, so it's a great uh, opportunity to continue your career here in the US. Um, on the other side, we have the blended program. Uh, this was developed as an alternative, uh, shorter program. Um, with the option for non-traditional students who may be uh, much further in their professional or academic careers and are looking for that um, supplemental training to sort of uh, re-energize their, their career outlook and possibly advance to further positions in their own organization return or return um, to their previous employers with, um, with that newfound um, outlook. With that in mind, the blended program uh, combines an online component of the MITx MicroMasters. Um, so you would uh, begin those five online classes, uh, obtain the MicroMasters, and then um, apply to the blended program, where you would continue your studies here at MIT for uh, one term uh, between January and May. Um, so just a five months out of the workforce, um, which gives you a little bit more flexibility uh, to take a sabbatical or leave, leave of absence um, or to transition to a completely new career if that's um, what you have in mind. So that just sets the stage of the two program pathways we have. Uh, and then just to outline that uh, more in terms of the timeline of each program for the residential program, um, the onboarding period is from March to July. Um, since it's just a 10 month program, it is rather intense in terms of preparation over the summer and then jumping right into our orientation in August, um, which includes introductions to our research program, uh, recruiting prep, um, and making sure that you have the, the analytical background to um, really hit the ground running in the fall. For the fall and spring terms, you would have uh, in-person classes here at MIT, um, dedicated supply chain classes, along with classes um, from the Sloan School of Management and the School of Engineering. Um, we have career coaching, a research project that we mentioned earlier, uh, and then a experiential study trek that um, happens in the spring. Uh, along the way in uh, the January term, which we call um, IAP, we have a three week period of um, collaboration with our scale partner centers. Um, students from uh, Europe, Asia, Latin America come to um, MIT uh, to engage in this three week long um, period where we have workshops, guest speakers, and uh, a very large research uh, expo um, symposium of your research experience so far. And all of this culminates with the completion of the program in May and your MIT degree. Along the blended pathway, um, it begins a little bit different as you would complete the online MicroMasters uh, at your own pace, um, anywhere from uh, 12 months up to 18 months is uh, the usual duration, uh, but you set the you set your pace uh, and we have two exams throughout the year, uh, one around November and one in May to be able to apply to the blended program upon completion of the final um, CFX exam as a component of the MicroMasters. Uh, once you apply or are admitted to the blended program, 
you would then um, start the same um, sort of intensive pre-work period as our residential students, but you would do it fully remote. Um, so that begins with identifying your research project, working with company um, sponsors and advisors remotely, and joining our webinars. Um, so it does take some commitment um, in that pre-work stage just before arriving to MIT in January. Uh, once you do arrive in January, just as I mentioned before, you would uh, begin your um, compressed orientation, but then join right in with the rest of the program for our um, Scale Connect, um, connecting with our residential students that are on campus and the students that we uh, bring in from across the world uh, to have that global network um, experience. Finally, moving into the spring term, both cohorts combine and uh, enjoy the same spring term experience, full class load from MIT, um, more career coaching opportunities, hopefully solidifying those job offers um, before moving out of uh, MIT, uh, finishing your research projects, and all that culminates with the presentation of your, your work so far. And then both degrees, both the blended and residential, and with the same MIT degree, um, a Master of Applied Science uh, in Supply Chain Management for most students, um, or a more advanced um, Master of Engineering for those who are looking to uh, take on a much uh, more strenuous research approach to their um, project. So with that in mind, just setting the stage, um, this webinar will focus mostly on life at MIT and the student experience. Um, so with that in mind, we have uh, five student guests. Um, and I have up here are our four student ambassadors, and we have one additional guest, um, Lauren Konopinski, who has uh, kindly joined us as well. Um, sorry, I didn't include your picture here, Lauren. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. with that in mind, we will have um, brief introductions from each of the students um, to say like where they've been and how they um, joined the program here. And then we'll dive right into questions. Um, I have some questions to get the ball rolling, but we are more than happy to take any sort of questions from the audience um, to really get a good sense of their experience, why they chose MIT. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and why don't we pass it along to Liam first um, to just introduce yourself and then um, continue from there. Awesome, sure, hopefully you can hear me okay. So I'm in kind of a public space, but hi yeah. everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Liam, great. So I grew up in Austin, Texas um, for the past five years before the program. I lived in Boston, um, so right on the other side of the river, working at Accenture, mostly in life sciences, supply chain consulting roles. Um, I was a supply chain major in undergrad, worked briefly at Boeing there as well. And yeah, I came to MIT to kind of hone the hard skills and, and kind of improve my technical skills and um, have been hopefully improving at that in the last semester since. So um, I'll pass it off to whoever's next. Nice to meet everyone. Um, thanks, Lee. I can go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah. I was born and raised in China, and uh, I did undergrad at U.S. Um, in Indiana University, double majored in supply chain management and information systems. Um, prior to MIT, I worked at a Cummins as a power solution company um, for the April four years as a senior planning analyst. Um, I'm kind of from Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. I guess it's my turn to introduce myself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elise Fredericks. I grew up in a small town in um, rural New Hampshire. I studied supply chain management and marketing at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. Prior to joining MIT, I was working in aerospace and defense for Pratt & Whitney, doing materials management for one of our international military customers. Um, and I think that is just about everything. I actually made the full move to Boston so I'm no longer in my current position um, and I live in the city and, and I'm hoping to stay here after graduation. So at least uh, Jason Main here. I'm from the Midwest in the United States, a little town called Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I have a, I'm a non-traditional uh, student in my undergrad. I didn't start until I was in my mid twenties. Um, really studied supply chain management and accounting, uh, double bachelor in both uh, supply chain and accounting, really kind of got my passion for uh, supply chain in my earlier careers. Uh, that led me down this, <laughs> this path. It's very uh, winding to get here, but uh, currently work in the utility sector, uh, have some background in uh, 
analysis and commodities management, as well as my most recent role, which is a program manager of our warehousing. Great. And I'm Lauren Panapinski. Nice to meet everybody. I uh, am from Chicago, Illinois. I did my undergrad at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and double majored like Leah in supply chain management and information systems. Um, prior to coming to the program, I was with BP. I joined through like a graduate rotational development program in marketing and sales, finance and supply. And then most recently was working in um, like the digital transformation space uh, within our supply um, and midstream division. I am part of the residential program here at MIT. Excellent, thank you everybody for um, uh, giving your introduction and um, your recent job. Um, recent jobs that you had prior to joining the program. Um, so one initial question to just jump right in is what made you decide to come to MIT? Um, why did you apply or what specifically drew you um, to a master's degree at this point in your life? Um, opening it up to anyone who wants to start. I can start with, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Elise, you first. Sorry, I feel like everyone wants to jump in at the same time, uh, but I'll make mine brief. I am in a transition period, actually, in my career. I'm using this master's degree uh, to pivot the direction that I'm going or the discipline within the supply chain umbrella um, that I'll focus in. Um, but what drew me to MIT specifically is the opportunity to learn from some of the most brilliant minds in this field. I'm just constantly in awe of the research that not only our professors, but the um, partners of the CTL have been able to accomplish. And I wanted to study under them. So that was really what drew me to this program. And I did choose to do a master's in supply chain as opposed to a more general degree, because I've found that this is the field that I'm very passionate about, and I wanted to make sure that I was the subject matter expert in, in all things supply chain going forward. Um, so that is what drew me to this program. Awesome. Um, so I think I hinted on this a second ago, but yeah, for me, I wanted to first be in a program that was only one year. So it was a big pull for me. I think um, for me, one year is perfect and the two-year MBA is a bit too much. Um, but the other thing that drew me was for me, it's a nice blend in this program of kind of a supply chain business perspective and engineering perspective. So a lot of our coursework is in Sloan, but a lot of it is more engineering focused as well. So um, I felt like in consulting, I was working on a lot of soft skills and presentation skills and those kind of things for a long time, but I hadn't had a chance to actually like learn from a bit more of a technical perspective. Um, and obviously there's no better place than, than MIT to do that. So that was one of the big pulls for me. Is that kind of towing the line between business and, and engineering. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Leah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so yeah, the real, I think the biggest reason for me to join MIT this program is because um, my managers, they graduate from this program, both of them. And uh, back to Cummins, where I work, there are several colleagues, they, all of them actually come from this program. I work, the, work with them a lot on projects. I'm very impressed by their knowledge and their talent. Um, I know that supply chain is something that I want to stay. I want to be a um, subject of matter, like Elisa mentioned. Um, and I know I'm doing supply chain master. So, and it's a one year program. Uh, I don't need to spend two years in school, that's too long. Um, and I can get my payback. The payback experience is quite, uh, quite short. So that's why I come here. Lauren, go ahead. Thanks, Leah. Um, so I first heard about this program through the Supply Chain Excellence Program. Um, so MIT works with uh, some undergraduate supply chain programs across the U.S. Um, and offers a scholarship. So that was something that I had um, kind of on my radar since graduating from undergrad. I don't know if anyone on the call is from like a participating university, but if you have any questions, and Jason is a fellow, uh, fellow Supply Chain Excellence student. So if uh, anyone has questions about that, feel free to ask. Yeah, really, uh, just finally wrapping this up, echoing everybody's sentiments, the, the short term of the program is is highly motivational for, uh, at least for me. Um, I also was the participant in the Supply Chain Excellence Program, uh, where I had a, a 
professor who got his master's, got his PhD here. Um, and I was considering a traditional, you know, master's of business analytics, something like that. And he said, really, if you want to make a difference as a practitioner in the industry, go with a, the master of supply chain from MIT. So I had, you know, uh, some incentives from the, the short term of it, you know, having been a non-traditional student, I was already behind the eight ball. Um, I felt like in terms of getting my career, because I, I changed at the age of 32, what I was doing. So um, that's been a big part of it. And then just, you know, like Elise said, some of the most brilliant minds uh, are here and, and the things that they're unlocking and looking at and solving are amazing. And it's, it's nice to be a part of that. That's great. Thank you, everybody, for your um, for your insights. And I know that is a um, that's probably the the hardest starting point for prospective applicants to decide if they're ready to take the plunge and um, invest the time and money to join the program. So I think you've offered some great examples uh, of your success so far. <laughs> um, in that same vein, um, one great question that we have from a guest online is what do you wish you had done before joining the program? Um, so is there something that uh, could have prepared you more or um, something that you would have done differently um, before, before getting to this point? <laughs> I, I have one right off the bat. Um, if, if you're not, uh, me coming from a non-traditional role, my background's actually in law enforcement. Um, spent a 10 year career, dealing with, with people in a correction setting, I did not have a ton of research experience. Um, so one of the hardest things for me has been diving into academia uh, in terms of research papers. I didn't have to do a ton of that in my undergrad. Um, so it was a skill set that was not really it, very roughly honed for me. So I wish I had spent a little more time um, studying that and, and being a little bit better at diving into the research side of things. I feel like that would have been more helpful. I can share one. Um, I think I would say if you're, <clears throat> depending on where you're at in your life and when you think you wanna go back to school, um, if this is something that you're gonna pursue, I would just say to think about it early. Um, I wish that I had kind of shortly after graduating undergrad, undergrad, just buckled down and taken the GMAT or the GRE and gotten it out of the way um, so that that wasn't a barrier to entry. Um, later when I was thinking about applying, I think it would have been easier when I was fresh out of school and used to studying. Um, and those scores last for a little bit. So you can kind of see when you want to take that. Um, and just in terms of like research and looking into programs, I did explore um, like MBA programs, going back part-time, um, looking at a few other programs around the country. Uh, it's a good amount of research. So I would say just start early so you're not bumping up to deadlines. Um, yeah, I'll just echo that a bit. Comments. Uh, Elise, go ahead. Go ahead again. <laughs> We're always the exact same spot, no worries. Um, go ahead. Mine, mine is not necessarily just something that I wish I had known or would have changed, but it's actually something that um, I would encourage others to do. I am a blended student like Jason. So I did the five micro master's courses before um, going through with the application process. And I had done, I took no breaks in between taking those classes and applying to the program. And I think that that was a real asset. That was a real benefit to me because I had all of the knowledge that I had just learned and I'm just carrying it right through until graduation in May. And I feel like that quick timeline really did help me. So I would encourage all of you who are considering the blended route to try to work that schedule so that you do the five courses in 18 months or whatever is a, a good timeline for you and then go right into the program. There are some people who took some pretty significant gaps, um, but I think that it would benefit you in the end if you did it more at an accelerated pace. Awesome. Yeah, I was just gonna say like echoing Lauren's, it's a long process from application to entry and everything, whether that's like an MBA that you're looking at or um, this program, but just start early. If you're worried about doing it, you know, one year or the next, just apply this year. And if it doesn't work out, like you have the next year versus, you know, if you're a year late, then it's you know, your only chance where it makes sense in your career. Um, that's not as optimal. So just, if you're thinking about it all, I'd say get started early. It's a long timeline. Um, and there's nothing specific from a skill set that I think you need to like 
practice early. I think to at least this point, like it's helpful. If it's all fresh uh, in your mind. It'll definitely make it easier for you. Like if you're graded Python, that'll be easier for you. If you're graded all the topics in the supply chain courses, uh, but don't be stressed if you, you know, have taken them a little bit. You can always catch up uh, as I've had to do, but um, it's definitely helpful if it's top of mind. Um, I want to add uh, to Elise's point. Um, I am a residential student, but I actually completed a micro master before uh, I joined the program. It's really good for you to understand, to get a taste of what the program is like and what um, the professor's lecture teaching style, what's your knowledge level. And once you get, if you are going to do a residential and you take a micro master, you're actually able to waive some courses. Um, it definitely will help you get ready for the program. I think one last thing too, to Elise's point about the timing of it, I did it in 10 months. Um, I had just graduated uh, with my undergrad in supply chain management and accounting. Um, I, the pandemic hit and I was on a timeline. So I hit the ground and I ran and I ran as fast as I could. I took up to three courses at a time. Uh, it was a very rigorous load. Um, I would spend six, seven hours a night uh, working on uh, the coursework. So remember to take it at your pace. If, if you need to do two or three years, because that's what your finances provide or, or your timing, because you have other obligations, family, whatever, um, you know, make those adjustments. But the, the quicker that you can do it, the better, the more knowledge I think that you'll retain. Uh, but you may not, you may want to not do it in 10 months um, because everything just gets smushed together like that and, and you might have some uh, knowledge that doesn't stick. Great, Jason. Thanks for the insight. <clears throat> and along uh, Jason's earlier point um, and a question that we had from the audience is uh, regarding if the program is more research oriented or practical practical oriented. Um, and I will say that um, from my perspective, that is one difference of doing the supply chain management program versus an MBA is we are in the school of engineering. So we do have a very um, applied science approach to, to education. So the research project is a, a required component of the program. Um, blended students are able to propose projects um, in the admissions process and potentially bring them to MIT, um, residential students get to select projects um, from our partners, our research partners <clears throat> here at the Center for Transportation and Logistics. But um, in either case, uh, definitely we're looking for students who are interested in committing um, to that 10 month long um, research experience. And I don't know if any of you have any comments on your um, research project so far. I think you've reached the halfway point now, um, hopefully maybe a little bit further, <laughs> um, if you have any thoughts on that. Maybe just one oh, comment yeah, yeah. on my end. Uh, sorry, Liam, do you want to go? Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, I, depending on the path you take, if you are doing um, a capstone project and uh, depending on your research partner, so I'm partnered with a company right now, um, it is a research project, but it can feel very kind of practical. It's um, pretty familiar to some of the stuff that I worked on um, when I was actually working with a company other than the fact that we're pulling in research and pulling in kind of uh, the existing literature and knowledge on the topic. And um, I guess increasing the scope to try to add something to the discourse and the discussion around the topic. Um, but some of the nitty gritty details of the project itself is pretty similar to things that you could work on if you're in the supply chain industry. So that's a cool aspect. Awesome, yeah, I was just gonna say, and you probably heard this from, from Robert and seen it on the website, but you have the choice in the residential program, right, to choose a thesis or a capstone. I think from that question, the thesis is more, you know, research focused, the, and the capstone is really in my mind both because it's part research, but then part applying it practically with the company and that problem that they brought through, you know, MIT. So it's either, you know, your focus is purely on research, maybe the thesis is right for you, or if you want that practical element while still getting the research, Kind of blended into that, then I think the capstone's a, a nice blend of both, and you have the kind of choice of which of those two options you want to pursue. Excellent. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, one follow-up question is: What sort of research resources would you recommend? Um, 
I will say that during the program itself, we do offer, you would have an advisor here at CTL. So <clears throat> you would have a research, a dedicated research uh, mentor um, who would help along the way. And many of our companies have also done projects in the past. So there's a good um, support network there in terms of actually writing and putting together the components um, in both the fall and the spring, students take um, supplemental writing classes to um, be able to hone uh, your writing skills as well. So those are just additional um, components to the, to the research process overall. <laughs> Uh, great. So one additional question that we have here is, um, and this I think is actually a very good one, is has your career outlook changed at all um, from when you originally applied to now that you've gone through the program a little bit further? Um, did you always know that you wanted to do a like job X and now going through the program, you actually got an offer from job Y and it's much different than you would have thought. Um, so any thoughts there just on your career uh, journey so far. <laughs> I'll answer this first. Um, so I'm still in the process just for transparency sake. I'm, I'm still in the process of applying. I have not received any offers yet, um, but I will share that I came from a very structured industry, aerospace and defense, not a lot of wiggle room. It's very, very rigid because you're working on behalf of the government. Um, and I'm actually in a class now, which uh, opened my eyes to the possibility of working for uh, humanitarian organizations and doing logistics for them. Um, and that is not something that had ever been on my radar before, but it's something that I'm seriously considering now because of the applications that we've had in class and, and the uh, benefit that I see. I, I actually am really passionate now about using the skills that I'm learning in school to help others in a way that I, I didn't think that was possible. So that certainly has changed for me. I don't know, you know if I'll end up pursuing a, a career, but I know that there are organizations who are looking for volunteers that have supply chain skills. And I think that that would be something that I continue on after the program, even if it's not in the um, formal package of a job offer. I'll go next, I guess. I think for me, it hasn't changed it so much just because I came from consulting and I plan to return um, to the consulting space afterwards, but I definitely used it to sort of pressure test, first of all, like, is this something that I want to continue to do? Because we have the chance to see you know, lots of firms come in and give info sessions and alumni come in and give kind of more details about their role and what it's like. And for me, it was a good way to pressure test that this is something that I want to do, but I will say that it has kind of enhanced it <laughs> from a perspective. Like I, in my essay wrote that I probably will, you know, return to consulting, but with a whole host of skills that I didn't have before. And hopefully the ability to kind of climb through the, the kind of consulting ladder a lot more quickly than if I didn't have that. So um, I think for me, it's, it's definitely enhanced it, but as far as like the outlook, it's been able to remain pretty steady for me as far as thinking what I want to do when I come in to what I'll end up doing uh, when I come out. So. Um, I can go next. Um, so my background was in automotive industry. And prior to the program, I was open for anything. I want to try maybe tech and or um, consulting. It's definitely one of them. Uh, but I'm open for everything. So I prepared both like a lot of behavior interview and case interview. And I ended up get a consulting offer. So I guess that's where I'm going to go um, after the program. And I know that I have many friends in this program. They were in like uh, Elise at a program with me and they are looking for healthcare opportunities. And I know some friends, they work in Microsoft before and they are looking for more sustainability role. So the resource in, uh, in MIT in our programs a lot. It can definitely can help you to switch gear to go to the industry you've never been before. Yeah, maybe just echoing uh, Leah's point, my background is in the energy industry. Um, I will caveat this with, again, I don't know uh, where I'm going after the program, still exploring um, and still recruiting uh, and looking at returning to my previous company. So a lot of open doors at the moment. Um, but one thing I've really appreciated about the program is just getting exposure to what supply chain and supply chain roles could look like in different industries. Um, I think it would have been hard without coming to a program like this to make the leap. Uh, from oil and gas into another industry. 
um, without this kind of stepping stone. I've gotten feedback that my resume reads very oil and gas um, and my experience. So it would have been hard to do on my own. And I've appreciated just opening that um, those doors, I guess. Is there anything I would say uh, that has tremendously changed for me personally, um, just because of I'm in the utility sector, my capstone's on my company, I'm planning on going back to that company, um, but it did give me an appreciation for the other opportunities that, that do come out of this program. Um, and then a piece of that question that I don't know that we really touched on is one of the biggest benefits. It's, it's the four other people that are sitting on this call with me. Uh, the, the cohort that you join into uh, when you first join the residential program is going to be about 41 other people, but when we blend together with the blended and the residential, it's going to be 81 of some of the smartest peers that you have from across the world and the program staff, um, Robert, Len, uh, John, Justin, they all are so tremendously helpful as well as the research faculty. Um, that that's one of the biggest benefits of the program that you get uh, that exposure and and then building that network it's something that uh, i'll emphasize now but when you get here they will emphasize over and over and over again thanks just uh thanks jason that is definitely one uh hallmark of our program that uh we definitely pride ourselves on and um i'm sure all of you on the call can probably um can probably list at least a dozen alums that you've already interacted with um, or heard from over the past um, uh, five to seven months. Um, and that, that network is really uh, very important to build those connections and um, learn from others and then pass on the skills. So I'm sure we'll have all five of you back in some capacity in the future, <laughs> um, as well for the next class that may be watching uh, right now. <laughs> um, Sort of along those lines of the connections or somewhat um, non-academic components of the program, have there been any uh, activities or opportunities that you've explored at MIT, in Boston, in Cambridge um, that, um, that you feel like are worth sharing? I know it's a, um, we sort of keep within the bounds of our program um, in E40, but there's definitely the Sloan School of Management and lots of um, programs and offerings throughout MIT. Uh, any that come to mind that you would like to share? So for me, of particular interest, uh, being in the utility space, it's something that I'm a little bit fascinated by is the research on nuclear fusion that's going on here on campus. Um, there's a, a tour that our group's going to be taking a little bit later with some of the nuclear program. Um, that's just super fascinating as, as we move away from um, more dangerous technologies in the, the power space, uh, you know, or, or those technologies that are contributing to climate change. Um, that's something that I've been watching for a long time and keeping a close eye on. I think it's super interesting and I love that it's, it's on the same campus that I'm on right now. Yeah, I'll sort of add, like, I think taking your perspective, Robert, of outside of the academics of our program, but still within academics overall, I think you have a lot of opportunity to explore, um, especially if you kind of do your credits strategically, some of your other interests. So what I've loved um, about having access to the rest of MIT is I'm able to explore some of those. So for example, I worked in pharma, pharma clients for a long time. And so life sciences is a space that I really like. Um, and last semester, I got to take a, a completely unrelated class to anything else I was working on, but it was on the kind of principles and, and practice of drug development. So it was with a bunch of cross-registered with like Harvard PhDs and applied math students and like bio majors and a few business majors. And I was the only supply chain person in that class, but a supply chain came up a few times in the context of, you know, drug manufacturing. So I got to lend some helpful insight, but I think that was an awesome way for me to just sort of fling myself like in a, a whole different direction on campus and explore something new and kind of like challenge uh, myself that way. But it's uh, like, you know, it's a world class sort of professor that teaches it. It's an amazing class. So it, it basically speaks to the network and the power of MIT that you have access to by doing this program. And so if you have you know, some other interests outside of supply chain, um, like Jason just mentioned, or for me, kind of life sciences, you have the opportunity to explore that at, you know, at the best university um, for science and math that's, that exists. Yeah, maybe just a couple of random things for me. I think to Liam's point, a lot of opportunities um, within 
the grounds of the, the university and I've enjoyed just being back on a campus. Um, I've joined like a graduate women's book club. Uh, so kind of trying to take advantage of making my own schedule and having a bit more freedom than I did during work life. Um, and that's been a fun way just to meet people outside of this program. To Robert's point, we kind of get stuck in a supply chain or Sloan bubble, um, just because that's who all your classes are with and your focus. Um, but it's been really cool to meet people studying and getting like PhDs in biology, just things that I wouldn't have come across um, normally. So that's been interesting. Uh, very random one, but it's been nice having a student discount again. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of different things you could take advantage of with that. So uh, yeah, just having the student card is fun. Yeah, I think even as staff members, I just went to the, the Museum of Fine Art last weekend, <laughs> which is free. So it's actually great to, to be so closely connected to the city that you can explore the, um, those things as well. And um, even one thing that I, even though I support the supply chain program, even I've done um, uh, lectures and gone to talks. One of my favorite was actually on exoplanet exploration from the uh, aeronautics and astronautics department. So it's like completely different than anything I've ever done, but it's very, I found it, I find space very interesting. So um, that, that was a, one of my personal experiences. <laughs> Uh, great. So one other question we have here, um, uh, we talked a little bit about um, our connection to Sloan and you've, you've all mentioned um, that you have classes with Sloan students as well. Um, has there been any um, sort of cross campus um, collaborations or um, projects that you've done? Um, entrepreneurship, maybe if you if anybody has any thoughts from uh, IAP on the different um, entrepreneurship sessions that we offered uh, or any of the competitions done so far? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, and other people can chime in too, but most of your like Sloan work is a lot in projects. And so when you're in a Sloan class, whether you know it's like a finance-based class or accounting, or I think we all have some different classes in Sloan, but there's no distinction between really like you are an SM student and you are a Sloan student. It's just like find a group, you know, four or five, to do your assignments or do your cases or do your projects and uh, so it's really on you i mean if you want to only work with supply chain students that's definitely an option but in um usually like we try to have a little bit of a mix to have one or two some students on a team of five or one or two SM students for example so it, you have complete access to sloan in that sense in terms of your cases and all of your classes projects and then some of the more like outside of class opportunities like delta v for example is a big sort of entrepreneurship startup competition um, you're more than welcome to, you know, reach out to Sloan students or find an engineering student. It's, it's totally up to you. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, a good portion of your curriculum is in Sloan. And when you're in there, everyone is sort of together as a student. It doesn't need to, it doesn't feel like a separated, um, that you don't have access to Sloan students or you can't work with them. It's, it's pretty much everyone's in the same boat. Yeah, I will say one benefit and on the other side curse of the program is that there's no restriction in terms of there's no restriction on the number of classes you can um, potentially take uh, up to the limit that we have within the program um, so that means you can explore classes outside of um, MIT or outside of um, uh, SCM or even MIT if uh, I don't know if anyone here took a Harvard class or not um, there's always that allure but uh, we try to keep you close by um, since there's plenty to still do um, at MIT. <laughs> uh, great, so I don't see any other questions yet, um, but one was, that I had that, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, Jason. Sorry, Robert, there was the one that Carol asked earlier about major trends on the job market's demand on SEM talents, what skills, quantities are they looking for? That was something that I, I wanted to, I was hoping that we'd get to. Um, yeah. One of the things that, I took, uh, before I finally settled on my schedule, took an operations management course. And one of the things that they talked about within the first few days, um, you know, typically the, the um, CEO, like the trend of CEOs is that they typically come from a very operationally focused area. Um, but then within that, if you look like the number two field behind that was supply chain management. Um, 
from their functional perspective. Um, I think it's supply chain, especially with the pandemic, one of the things that it's shown us is that there will not be a, a shortage, especially with the increase of global trade and, and other things that are going on and developing. Um, supply chain skills are coming at a premium. So if you know how to um, think logistically and that you can problem solve um, things that, that other people have looked at and said, well, that's not important, uh, but then it ends up becoming critical. I think that that's something that's gonna be extremely valuable. Um, but as far as specific skill sets, um, I don't know that there's any one area that I would target or say was more important or different than the others, but definitely realize that this is gonna make you a very marketable professional. Yeah, and I think that is actually a, an interesting point uh, in terms of the program, like our ability to be somewhat resilient to changes in the industry. Um, sometimes you might envision um, large institutions like this moving at a slow glacial pace, but the SDM program has been able to adapt and add um, new methodologies and tools. Um, just this year, we added Power BI, for an example, um, in terms of um, uh, visualization tools. Um, within the past two years, um, there's been a real focus on machine learning. Um, we've incorporated elements of Python as well. So um, we are very attuned to the trends. And just this year, we'll be reaching out to our alumni to see um, over the past um, 25 years of the program, what sort of skills have been the most valuable or what do they see as a uh, future trends that we can act upon. Um, and that's why we we introduced the machine learning element um, so um, so much uh, in the recent in recent years. So I think these are all elements that um, our program is definitely always changing. So if you ask an alum from five years ago, um, they would have taken um, some different classes or different focuses than than the ones that we have now. Uh, than, than the four of you that are that are here with us. Uh, excellent. So. I don't see any broad questions, but um, one that I can leave us with um, as people think, um, or we could um, start wrapping up the webinar um, just a little bit early if there's no other questions. Um, we sort of talked about this earlier, um, the piece of advice that you would give to an incoming student or somebody who um, is thinking about joining the program. Uh, and then I can close with my, my thoughts as well um, of what we're looking for um, on the admissions committee. I'll start. Um, so as someone who is in a transition period in their career, as I've mentioned, I would encourage incoming students to think long and hard about what they want their careers to look like after graduation from the program um, and cater your class schedule to really support or help you achieve those goals. Um, I can guarantee that <laughs> You might be overwhelmed by the number of course offerings that interest you, and you might be really inclined to just take all of them. And I actually thought that it was tricky to narrow it down or to, um, I guess, uh, cut down the number of credits that I was taking because there were so many courses that I was interested in. Um, but at the end of the day, how I framed it is, you know, what's going to help me in my career moving forward or, or what's going to help me in this next step. Um, so that would be my, my biggest piece of advice for incoming students. I can go next. I think, um, one of the pieces of advice I would give is just, if you're unsure, like just apply. Uh, I mean, if you have any doubt, I definitely go for it. I would say, don't be afraid that it's going to be like a, you know, a waste of your time or that the chances aren't good enough or something. Just, just definitely give it a shot. Um, the other thing is, I think you you can't do it alone as far as the application process. So just make sure like you have people that are going to be able to really support you in rec letters, right? That you've been working with or that maybe you've been reporting to. Um, if you have any peers that have gone through like a business school admissions or a master's school admissions process, like talk to them, reach out to them for advice on what they learned from the program. Just make sure like you, you use all the resources around you um, and it, it make sure that you're not just sort of siloed on your own as you apply and, and kind of um, get all the help that you can, but I would say those two things are, are what come to mind for me. Uh, 
Um, I want to add one thing is do not afraid to ask for help, no matter as the uh, current, like the previous students or cohort. Um, initially, I was kind of afraid of talking to people just to help me understand the program more um, because it's wasting, I, I, it might just take me a lot of time. But everyone is willing to help you. They would love to give you advice and help you need. Um, just don't break, don't hesitate, go for it. I had a unique advantage uh, in that two of my classmates um, from undergrad had actually gone to the program before I did. Um, and they, they subsequently ended up being the ones that were pestering me about uh, joining <laughs> if I was going to be applying to the program. Uh, they, they reached out and said, hey, you know, would you like to or you think about it? Uh, but one of the things, too, is one of the CTAs that was uh, instrumental to my learning during the MicroMasters also uh, went through the program. Um, and like Leah said, that network of, of ask questions, learn, have somebody, you know, could you read this letter for me or, or read my proposal for me? Um, that's actually what Danielle did for me. She, um, I wrote a proposal for my application and uh, she was there and willing and and very insightful and in helping me to kind of tune that. Um, I definitely did not get into MIT by myself. I had a vast network. My wife was very supportive. Uh, my family is very supportive. Uh, and then all of my peers that, that helped me to be here today are the reason that I am here today. I, I definitely did not go it alone. So I think that's a point that Liam brought up that's crucial is remember that you are not in this alone ask questions, ask for help. And, and you know, I, I'm certainly willing to, if you guys want to reach out, find me on LinkedIn, uh, run any questions by me, I'll, I'll answer anything for you. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much, Jason. And yes, one um, resource that we like to um, do a little shout out for is definitely our student blog, uh, where you can see um, uh, stories from our current students and previous students as well, um, sort of navigate their experience here at MIT, reasons to, to apply, uh, and the possibility to also reach out to them. Um, so just wrapping up, um, one uh, additional uh, note in terms of application tips, um, the tips that our student panelists have provided are definitely 100% in line with what we are looking for as well. Um, two other smaller components um, to keep in mind when you are submitting your application. One is our video statement. Um, it is very helpful for the admissions committee um, to get that sort of two minute snapshot of why you want to join the program. Um, uh, and uh, we definitely ask that you really try to be yourself, uh, underline there, avoid reading a script. We wanna see like why you're joining the program, what you hope to get out of it. Um, and it can be really minimal, just joining a Zoom call and recording it um, is definitely fine. Uh, it definitely helps our program out um, and, it, and um, gives a better perspective uh, on why, why we should admit you. Uh, another important aspect that we that's worth highlighting is just your resume. Um, since work experience is a component of the program, two years minimum, um, just making sure that you meet that requirement in some way. Um, but when you're laying out the resume, make sure that it's clear, identifying your experience when it was um, so that we don't have to hunt for the information too much. Um, it should be that one, one page concise information, uh, which is what will really help us um, review applications. Um, so and with that, we have three admission rounds for the residential program and two for the blended program. Um, we're approaching our final rounds in both. So for residential applications, you can apply by March 28th. So we have a few weeks um, until then. And for the blended program, as we mentioned, um, our application deadlines align with the MicroMasters program. So the next deadline will be in June uh, following the, uh, the May CFX run. So with that, I would like to say thank you to our panelists. Oops, I need to stop sharing. Um, thank you to our panelists for joining here. And of course, anyone online or watching this video um, afterwards, uh, feel free to reach out to us at scm at mit.edu. And we look forward to reviewing your applications or answering any questions in the future. Thanks again. Bye. Everybody, good luck.